Welcome to Northern Lights Christian Center. What a blessing it is to dedicate children unto the Lord, to have families gathered together, cousins and aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas. It's really a great time. And God bless this family that we were able to help and support and bless today in the name of Jesus. Today I would like to speak to you a few moments on what's called God's plan for the fam. Fam, F-A-M being the family. And we're going to look at some things in the Bible, and uh, we're going to talk about a day that would be so wonderful to create in our nation. I read recently this past week when I was out of town at camp, uh, part of a magazine of some of the days that happen or that have been designated as national holidays. I'll read just a few of them and then talk about the need that we have of celebrating that which is good. In this article, and I'm just giving you snippets of this, I'm leaving much, much of it out, but days in America, just in the month of June, we have National Say Something Nice Day, if you can imagine it. The fourth is National Donut Day. The sixth is D-Day. Also on the sixth is National Drive-In Movie Day. The seventh is National Chocolate Ice Cream Day. The 10th is National Urban Spices Day. The 11th is Corn on the Cob Day. 13th is Flag Day. 17th, National Eat Your Veggies Day. The 20th, National Father's Day. 23rd is National Hydration Day. 27th is National Sunglass Day. If you don't think there's a lot of relevance in those, I would agree with you 100% because... There is not. So then I wanted to see, is there a national, traditional Christian family day? And the answer is no. There is something created by what's called the World Council of Churches that says that we celebrate the Christian family traditionally and non-traditionally, which we understand the intonations that are there. There's another group that's called Evolve that says they have also created a national Christian family day but there's no right way to celebrate it, which just simply means it's a waffling of what God has said about creating what we know as the traditional family. So I would like to read a few scriptures today that's relevant to our subject. And in the points that I share with you, I'm going to talk about, Lord willing, today seeking a spouse, entering into marriage, having children, raising children, and doing all that we do to the glory of God. I would like to read the scripture which is found in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26. It says, Then God said. Would you say that with me today? Then God said. If we want to understand about family, if we want to understand about life, if we want to understand about giving or finance or life or church or military or anything else, the place and the source is the Holy Bible. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let us have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God blessed them and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish, the birds, the every living thing that moves upon the earth. Let us pray. Father, thank you today that we can share together in this divine interchange, Lord, of thoughts and truth. Thank you, Lord, that you created an internet and video recording capabilities and people who have been technologically invested with understanding and the ability to communicate amongst the human race and in our context today in the Bible and Christian truth. And we thank you for that. We pray that you open the hearts of everyone who's hearing, open the ears of everyone who's listening, open the eyes of all who are seeing. And Father, we ask you today to let the Holy Spirit come and live and dwell among us as we look at this most relevant subject in the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 
So in each one of these points that we're going to share, I will try to give you a quote from the book of Proverbs or more specifically a quote by Solomon, the wise man, the wisest man that ever lived other than Jesus. There's much good said about Solomon. Solomon had his own issues, but Solomon was given by God a very special gift to be able to communicate truth, not in the abstract form, but in the very practical ways. When contrasted with the book of Proverbs and Psalms, Proverbs is contrasted with Psalms in terms of Psalms is where you lift your hands, you open your mouth, you sing to God, and you give praise, or you pray to the Lord. It's all about praying and praising the Lord. Proverbs is all about thinking, future, and living life well today. And so in this passage of Scripture, we're going to look not at the ethereal or the praise or the psalm end of it, and even the psalms that we do quote will be quoted from that which is written by Solomon. So let's look at family, God's plan for family, as we find it in the scripture. The first thing about family is seeking a spouse. Maybe some of you who are listening today are young people, or maybe you're seeking a spouse or you're asking God about that. We're going to look at just three or four principles that are applicable to our subject today. First of all, we need to understand that in the beginning, which we read, God created them male and female. When they came to Jesus, They asked him about marriage and divorce, and they were talking about the concept of marriage. Jesus says, in the beginning, God, in the creation, God created them male and female. It's very, very clear. Now, people today, as of today, currently, this week, they said there are 67 different genders, 67 different genders. Is that true? That's made up. That's fabricated. It's a lie. It's not true. But there are male, there are female And that is created by God, and God said that was the unique concept of seeking a spouse. And so when we look at this, we find that the word later on in the same early passages where God was going to make a help meet, as the old King James says, I'm using a military version today, and in this passage of Scripture you see that God caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam, And then he took one of his ribs and closed up the place thereof, the first surgery ever made in history. The rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she is taken out of the man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, be joined unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh." Earlier it says that there was not a helper, a helpmeet found for Adam. And really what he's saying there is a helper suitable, one who is corresponding, a male and a female. And so, first of all, we need to understand that our pursuit for a spouse needs to be that of the opposite sex. That's very clear in the Bible, male and female. That is God's way, that is God's eternal word and his concept of creating what we say marriage or the first steps of a family life. Also, sometimes people say that men are better than women, women are better than men. Please understand this. In the scripture, in Christianity, there is no inferior roles from a biblical perspective of marriage. It does not exist. God created man. God created woman. God created male. God created female. It is his way. It is his work. And so we can rebel against that. We can write articles against it. We can uh, react against it. Or we can simply submit and say, God, this is your way. And one of the things that we're seeing happening in America today is we're going back to a grassroots movement, back to basics. This is definitely one of those ways where we can come back into the correct understanding of what we're calling marriage in this particular way. We cannot embrace what's fabricated in lust, what's created as an alternative lifestyle, or anything that's anti-biblical. We need to stay with the Bible. We need to say what Jesus said in the beginning of creation, God created male and female. What God has placed together, let not man put asunder. 
it's so vitally important that we go God's way. Here's some absolute principles that will always be a part of every relationship. A, Christians should only marry Christians. Christians should not marry unbelievers. Sometimes that happens. And then I was thinking, actually, after I put this message together, somebody said, well, I'm married to an unbeliever. If you love each other, stay together. God loves people and marriages and the context of which that was written. Sometimes people came to Christ. The other partner didn't want anything to do with Christ. And as a result of that, they separated. And the Bible says the person is not in bondage in such a situation. But God is for marriage. God is for men and women coming together. God is for what we call the institution of marriage. That's the bulwark of society. That is what has been created by God to move family life, to be the bedrock of faith for every people group in the whole nation. It has always been. It is that way today. It shall always be true. Absolute principle. Another one is not only should a person who is a Christian marry a Christian, but marry the right Christian. Marry the right person. Just because a person is a Christian doesn't necessarily mean they're, that person is supposed to be your spouse. That's kind of the low bar to be a Christian. But then Check out your gifts, your talents. Check out your family relationships. Uh, check out uh, how you coordinate together. Do you have some love there? Do you fight all of the time? There was one young lady that I knew, and she was sick all the time. And uh, she was a great young lady. She's been, she's a friend of our daughters and been up to our place many times. She was sick all the time, or she had to leave and have these panic attacks. And and so I, I'm like, what goes on here? And she was telling me she's in a relationship with this young man. I met him. And, and I said, well, you know, you need, you need to really think about that. That may not be real healthy. Anyway, she broke off the relationship, and she got better. She got healthy. She married a different young man. They're doing good. They have children. They're living down in Oklahoma, doing great the last time I saw them. What is that about? It's not just about finding a Christian, but you need to sense the Lord's will, parents' will, pastoral, uh, people who know you, love you, and who are for you. Listen to that divine counsel and ask God for direction, and he will certainly be a part of that. Not only do we need to seek a spouse God's way, but secondly, we need to enter into marriage God's way. Marriage is a covenant. It is honorable. Our scripture today is in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 4, where the scripture says, Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let's look at that just for a little while. Here today, the apostle, some think it's Paul, I tend to think it perhaps is Apollos or someone else, but the scripture doesn't say who wrote it, but the Bible does say through the apostle that marriage is always honorable to the Lord. The scripture says in Proverbs, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. It's very important that we are seeking the right things. And the Bible says that when a man and a woman come together, God brings all kinds of favor to that particular man and to that uh, relationship. It's important that we understand God is looking to bless people. Marriage is honorable in all things that are considered, as the apostle says, but the bed is undefiled. That means you need to live right. You need to be faithful. You need to be understanding the right way of sexuality and, and the relationships that God has made with one another. It's very powerful and positive to receive God's instructions. That means we need to be faithful. God blesses faithfulness. God blesses purity. God blesses wholesomeness. That's his way. That's the way that he operates. The next thing we see is in Ecclesiastes, the Bible says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. If one fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to the one who is alone. If two lie down together, how can they keep warm except they have one with them? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. We need to understand that marriage is a concept that comes from God, and it's threefold. A lot of times we think that marriage has to do with the man and woman only. No, there's many more, just as we've seen today in this baby dedication, where you have aunties and uncles and cousins and brothers and sisters gathered together to stand for. We will bless this child. We will pray for this child. We will be a part of what 
God is saying and doing in the life of this child. That's very, very important that we do that. And then next we need to see that marriage is meant to be pure, and when you come together, you become a powerful force for the Lord. It's very important. The Bible says if any two of you agree together, God will hear and answer those prayers. If somebody comes against you, they may be able to take one person, but two people are almost impossible for one person or one enemy to enter. It's very important to have wise relationships, good relationships, healthy relationships, friends and families that are a part of you. A church family is God's idea. That means we're not fighting it out, eking every part of our faith out by ourselves. We're standing together with brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I want to encourage you today that as a family, as a church family, as a natural family, that we become powerful when we come together in the name of the Lord. The third and final aspect of entering into marriage is that marriage is a covenant. It's a blood covenant. It's saying vows. It's saying, I will not leave this relationship as long as I'm alive, and I'm not free from it unless my spouse dies. That's very clear. Now, we live in a culture that's very broken. We live in a time in history when relationships are very fragile. We're living in a time when people do not understand faithfulness, perhaps as they once did, but God never changes. Now, there is help and there is hope even after a broken relationship. And in our church handbook, we're very clear on this. It's not just about marriage and divorce. It's about what's driving the problem in the first place. Until you fix that problem, that weakness, that insecurity, that fear, that lust, that ungodliness, that waywardness that's there, until you address that, you'll go into another relationship and it'll be worse than the first one if you don't repent from the evil and the wrong that's there in the first place. Marriage is a covenant before the Lord and we need to honor those who honor God's way, and God does always bless faithfulness. Well, not only are there the areas of seeking a spouse and entering into marriage, but let's talk about having children for a few moments. Next, we find that having children and being together as parents and having children is God's way. It's God's idea. It's God's way of perpetuating the human race. And so it's very important that you and I understand God's way in this. We'll also look at a proverb uh, at this a little bit later. It's really important that you and I are people who connect with God and understand that a threefold cord is not easily broken. That means that a man and a woman come together. Yes, that's a double that's two are better than one, but a threefold cord is we bring God. When God is with the marriage and God is with the family and God is with the church, the blessings of the Lord flow to that marriage, institution, church family, whatever it happens to be. And also we find that when we come together to have children, that it's exciting, it's advancement. We even call it, we're expecting. That means good is on its way. This is a golden moment, a powerful time. It means that we become more responsible. One of the things that we're supposed to do as the clicker of age goes up, the maturity level of relating to one another also should increase. And so when you, have children, when you get married, there's more responsibilities. The basic difference between a child and an adult, at least in the real world, it needs to be re taking responsibility, being responsible. A child is not responsible to feed himself. The mother takes care of him. The mother can nurse a baby. A father and mother come together. They work. They take care of that child. That child has no obligations at all. That child is just there. It's taken care of. It's taken care of by two people who have taken responsibility before God, and they're loving every child. They're helping every child. Somebody say amen. And so when we look at this area of having children, sometimes people say, well, how many children should we have? Well, there's no book on that. There's no course. You find in the Bible, some people have many children. Some have as little as one. 
Some have none. And so as a result of that, that's something that you need to seek the Lord. There is no golden rule on how many children. You need to uh, understand that it's different, maybe for different people. But God does want people to have children. That's a good thing. It's a blessing. Some things that people have said to me as a pastor, even as a family member, they say, I'm scared of that. I don't really know which way to go. Other people say, it's a crazy world. I don't want to have kids. Other people say, I've seen children turn out really, really bad, and so they become afraid. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And so when we live in a world that's broken and corrupt, we shouldn't be afraid of this world. God will take care of us. God will help people raise children. God will help children in the midst of it, sometimes in the worst circumstances. There's something about children. They want to be resilient and come rise to the top. When people go through difficult times, it's not a time to shrug off or run away or go put your head in the, under a blanket. It's a time to stand up, speak up, and stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ and his wonderful ways. So we can't be motivated by fear. Here's what the wise man Solomon said, Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain that build it. Behold, children are the heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Like arrows in the hands of a mighty man, so are children to one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. And here the Bible gives many blessings. This psalm that I quoted is by Solomon, Psalm 127. A quiver is simply an envelope or an encasement to hold arrows, presumably uh, on one's own body. And we've seen a good movie to watch is the old 1938 version of Robin Hood. And you can see that portrays uh, what I'm trying to say here very clearly. It's, you need those weapons. You need those arrows. You need a quiver full of them. In fact, the next verse goes on to say in that psalm that these arrows who speak of children shall become strong and powerful and be able to overcome the enemy in the gates. The gates is where the battle was. The gates is the Bible even talks about the gates of hell that comes against the church. You and I, if we raise up children the right way, we love them, we care for them, we go into their world, we minister to them, we raise them up in the name of Jesus, we care for those people, we make that choice to cooperate with the Lord, not only in the fabrication of children in the womb, but also taking care of them when they're here and they're among us. The next one is called training children. So we've talked about seeking a spouse. We've talked about entering into marriage. We've talked about having children. Let's talk a few minutes about raising children. Not only do you need to have children, but there is another part. Having children, raising children are two different things. And so we find here in the Bible, let's look at what the wise man says. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. Now, you have some people say that's a proverb. That gives you the lottery of winning. Uh, your odds are doing pretty good. That's not what that scripture says. And neither is it a something if you have a child, that child's automatically going to follow the Lord. No, you need to partner with God for the children to raise them up in the name of the Lord. Once God has given children, we need to determined beforehand that we will raise up and train that child in the ways of the Lord. There's two ditches. One is, in fact, there's laws against this. One is abuse where you take power and force and you use it in a negative way against the child. The other one is called abandonment where you actually leave a child. Both of those are wrong ways and to leave a child to himself. The Bible says a child left to himself shall bring his mother to shame. And so a child is to be cared for, loved, uh, understood, spend time with them, talk to them, minister to them. If they're two months old, two years old, 20 years old, continue in that time of ministering to your children, talking to them, raising them up, not just having them, but bringing them into the place where you're training them in the ways of the Lord. There's two parts of this, one part of training the word train, by the way, means to educate, it means to prepare, means to equip, 
It means to consecrate and give them to the Lord. It means to dedicate them to the Lord, just as we've seen this morning in this baby dedication. It means to catechize and ask them questions. It means to go into their world and understand what's happening. The word train here, it carries the idea to be in a relationship where they're growing. And the older you get, the more you will love your parents, the more you'll love your mentors. And it's really vital that you and I understand that raising children and then training children in the way that they should go will bring glory and honor to the Lord. There's two dimensions that I'll talk about today. The first one is rebuke. When part of the training or the disciplinarian part of raising children is you show them what's wrong and you say no that's a bad attitude and no don't stick your tongue out don't trip uh, little kids uh, don't be mean to other kids so you rebuke that don't get angry and beat everybody and kick people around no 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 so you rebuke that you stand against that the other part of it is you affirm you welcome you love you tell them how much you care for them so there's two hands god's given us two hands to train children one of them is to show and expose the wrong, the behavior, the thinking patterns that are not good, the attitudes that may develop, the relationships that may be in an unhealthy way, affections that will take people away from God. That's one thing that we expose. The other thing that God calls us to do is to affirm. To It's the charity it's aspect. It's the love for people. It's to do good for people. It's the prudence or the preparation for the future is what the word prudence means. It's a wisdom of how to live life. It's showing divine ability. It's training up a child in the way he should go. Find out that ability. Find out that bent. Find out what motivates that child. I come from a family of four other siblings. We're all very, very much different. Uh, my, I have four sisters, and they have different gifts, different talents, different things that motivate them. And so somebody says, well, I'm going to treat all my children the same. You, you don't treat all children the same. Some children, you look at them with a stern face, they'll, they'll repent, they'll turn. Other people, you can give them spankings, and that won't help them. What we do need to see that God has made every child unique. There is a key to your child's heart. The Holy Spirit has that key. He wants to give it to you. He wants to work with you, not only in having a child, but also in raising up that child. Now, as parents, we all make mistakes. God is merciful. God wants to help people. God wants to forgive. He wants to empower people, not only to recognize a mistake, but Let's grow from that. Let's grow from that experience. Let's see what maybe we can do to rectify that. How can we do better? I've had people in tears and saying, you know, I've, I didn't spend time with my family. I wasted my life. Well, here's you have an opportunity. You, maybe you're having grandchildren. What have you learned from that? Let's have some repentance. Let's don't cancel the culture. Let's learn from our mistakes. Can I hear an amen? And so as a result of that, God wants us to train up children in the way that they should go. The final aspect here is we need to bring them into our world and teach them. Let them see how we live life. If you're a father and a mother and you never pray, don't expect your children to pray. But if you're a father and mother and you come together and you just say, honey, let's just, let's just join hands, let's Pray the blessing of the Lord. Let's thank God for this food. We're in a tough spot right now, God, and you will find out that your children, if you seek the Lord in your problems, they will seek the Lord in their problems. If you thank the Lord for your meal, they will thank the Lord for their meal. If you respect and honor them, they will respect and honor you. Parents are given a charge by God to reach out and bless them and to stay in divine communication with every child at every stage of their life. Love them, care for them, invest your life in them. They're your children. Edify them. Encourage them. Draw them closer to Christ. Let them know that you love them. And finally... In this family matter, God's plan for family, 
is to do all things to the glory of the Lord. And I'm going to close with just quoting two or three verses here. The Bible says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter, says the Bible. Fear God, keep His commands, for this is man's all. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who only does only doeth wondrous things. Blessed be His glorious name forever. Let the whole world be filled with His glory. Therefore, whatever you do in drink or eat, do all to the glory of God. God has set a course before us. We don't just live for ourselves. We don't just live for our children. We don't just live for our church. We don't just live for our work. We live to the glory of God. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Influence. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Influence it. Jesus said, you are a city that's set, up, set upon a hill in display for everyone to see. You say, well, how can I do this in practical terms? How does this work? The first thing is, obviously, be a Christian. Repent of your sins. Trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Ask God's forgiveness. Ask Him to help you. In the matter of family, God is there to help us today. The second thing is we need to be a part of a Bible-believing church. If your church doesn't believe in the Bible, if your church disdains the Bible, if your church mocks the Bible, if you don't have times where you pray for people at the altar, if you don't have opportunities to personally respond to the Word of God, read, taught, preached, proclaimed, or heralded, you're missing the mark. So be a part of a church family that's Bible-believing. And then finally, live your life to the glory of God. Raise this child up to the glory of God. I work to the glory of God. I teach to the glory of God. I love to the glory of God. I reach out to the glory of God. And God is calling you and I today to His plan for the family. Yes, there's problems. Yes, there's issues. But this Bible gives us the way. This Bible shows us who Christ is. This Bible shows us how to find faith. This Bible teaches us that in the midst of a corrupt society, God wants to plant a pure and holy church. I would like to pray with you today and just ask God's blessing. Wherever you are, if you just take a few moments and in your heart, would you please pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, this time together. Thank you for this word and this message. We ask you, O oh God, to bless each and every hearer of the word of God, each and every viewer to the glory of God. Lord, we ask that your presence and your anointing will rest upon each one. I pray, Holy Spirit, you'll go into the hearts, the rooms, the cars, the buses, the homes, the families, of every person who's listening, watching today. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to penetrate deep into the hearts of every man and woman that's listening. For every family that's struggling today, Lord, I pray that you bring health and healing. For every husband or wife that may be struggling in any way, Lord, let those hearts be softened. Let the power and presence of God be upon them. And I ask you today, Lord, to fill us all with your Holy Spirit. Let us be about our Father's business. Let us be about doing good. Let us heal those who are sick. Let us vi violently come against the powers of darkness that tries to twist up the American and the traditional and the families of every ethnic group that's represented here. To the glory of God, in Jesus' name, can you all say, Amen. Thanks for tuning in to Northern Lights. Thanks for being part of the video presentation. Thank you, everyone, for being here and listening today. You can go uh, on our website or on some of the radio stations and uh, let the Lord bless you through the ministry. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you all.